Hi everyone, I'm Professor Sally Eve, CEO of Aspirational Futures. And it's a pleasure to speak today with Kia Binia, Vice President of IT Operations at Splunk. Welcome Kia, great to speak to you again. Great to speak with you, Sally. Great to be here. Oh, thank you so much. And I think today we're going to be exploring in some detail about building resiliency in teams amid this remote working environment. I'd love to maybe start by looking at the acceleration of cloud and digital technology. And what are some of the other changes you think will come as a result of the acceleration that's been happening going forward? Yeah. So over the last year, uh, as the pandemic took hold of our lives, uh, Overnight, almost uh, pe people were, uh, you know, IT teams had to pivot very rapidly to help uh, take care of the employees that that are in remote work. Uh, everybody had to re-evaluate their priorities and look at how to adapt to this new uncertain world. And there was a lot of positive lessons I think that were learned that I think we're going to carry forward. Uh, basically, what would have taken five or six years, some of the analysts have said, happened in five months, uh, because many of these organizations had to make uh, dramatic uh, investment, prioritization, and lean forward decisions around remote uh, the remote uh, remote ways of delivering their business services, taking care of their employees. Uh, and, and oftentimes what gets unrecognized is that the IT teams were the first responders to, to this crisis as it pertains to digital transformation. They were essential workers and they had to work endless hours. And uh, in, in many ways, the way they collaborated and they worked together had also changed uh, because now instead of being in a knock, or uh, you know where they can uh, you know view the status enterprise wide view of the system, or being in team meetings uh, constantly, or being able to uh, you know see there's a you know fire and call a war room. Everything was virtual, and that meant that uh, organizations need to get much better at uh, looking at data, sharing the data, collaborating based on data. Um, uh, the opportunity that it created was that it, it, you know, data is a great equalizer. It, it breaks down a lot of silos. It helps identify where the problems are. And so organizations that really adapted to this model uh, got a leg up and, and were able to move faster. Other organizations, uh, quite frankly, the pandemic was the wake up call around, hey, maybe it's time for us to revisit our uh, tools and technology so that we can move faster and collaborate more. For me, what you're saying there, Kia, really brings to the fore the importance of talent. You know, cloud transformation has been driven by that. We've got tech as this conduit that's bringing us all together. It's emphasizing connectivity on every different level. But what do you think that means for the future of skills? You know, what we're hiring for, the ways we're hiring people. What do you think we need to look at in terms of those skill sets to really accelerate digital transformation in the future? And what this means for change management, new processes, training and hiring? Well, I think definitely there there is an element of this, uh, you know, always I go back to people, process and technology. And as the technology changes, you need skill sets to manage the new technology and those are welcome. Uh, I think what, what's important is the process element, the process element around how different teams uh, interact with each other also needs to evolve and change. So we see the DevOps practices becoming more and more uh, applicable because they, quite frankly, uh, allow smaller teams, remote teams, to be able to collaborate uh, and, and continuously improve services. So those are skill sets, again, that we see in high demand. And, and quite frankly, skill sets that uh, you, you need to uh, invest in training your existing staff because Many of the folks who've been in the industry for a long time, uh, you've invested in them, they understand your business, they understand your critical systems. Uh, with a bit of training and, and some uh, real life practice, they will be fantastic uh, uh, employees of the future. Uh, one skill set that I want to call out, which is very important, I, I actually think that I believe genuinely that in our society, this is a skill that we need to emphasize. Uh, is, is the skill around being able to work with data. Uh, I've seen over the last year and a half so many blunders by politicians, by 
uh, medical experts. They they have the data. They can't communicate the data and uh, policies based on data. And I think this is this certainly happens within the IT world as well. Uh, we're sitting on mountains of data. Oftentimes that data is siloed and individualized. So the network team has data from the network. The server team has data from the servers. Uh, if mined correctly and if presented correctly, it's a huge enabler. And as I said, uh, we just have not uh, in, in you know, being in the data age, the irony is we don't emphasize teaching data science and uh, how to uh, work with data on a daily basis. I, I think data will be what the internet was uh, in, in the last two decades, where uh, today uh, we can all safely assume that people know how to go and Google search and find something. Uh, I'm hoping that in the next decade, data will be as accessible to everyone, where you can be presented with a set of data, be able to investigate it, be able to look at it, or, or have systems that are giving you insights from the data um, so that you don't have to become a data expert. Oh, absolutely. I could not agree more strongly with that. And I think from two perspectives, one, that understanding that data acumen, um, so to speak, that you were talking about, but also that meaningful storytelling with the data as well, and being able to translate that in the right way to the right audience, I think is absolutely key. I think something else you mentioned there around education more broadly as well is developing skills confidence. No, I, I wrote something recently kind of about the rise of the deep generalist, I, I called it. So kind of having a specialism, but having that toolbox, that holistic skill set that you can dip, dip into as things continually evolve. So you know, I talk a lot about STEAM learning, for example. So having that kind of creative confidence, emotional intelligence, communication skills alongside the technology ones, I think is absolutely key. And kind of helping people learn smarter as well. So skills like metacognition, you know, understanding how you learn, what your preferences are. I think is so important as well. So we talk a lot about smart technology, but maybe less so about kind of that smart thinking and helping people facilitate through that process as well. I think that's going to be really, really pivotal as we as we move ahead. So yeah, I love those themes that you're bringing out there. Fantastic. And kind of from an employer perspective, maybe, what do you think the key challenges are from their perspective in terms of navigating this hybrid workforce as we move ahead? Well, I think they they have to maintain their curiosity. And again, I, I think curiosity is one of the uh, you know hardest things to test for or interview for. But uh, if if you look at uh, this new world as a great uh, opportunity to really and 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 I, I genuinely believe this, uh, like never in human history, uh, you can have a twelve year old in uh, in uh, Bangladesh become the world's greatest violinist by having internet access and having the curiosity to know what they want. Obviously, they need a violin, but, you know, it's no different than, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, 60-year-old who decides all of a sudden they want to be a sushi chef and want to experiment. If we were to take a look at our careers in the same way, in, in almost saying that, look, uh, there is no barrier uh, if I'm curious and I'm willing to jump in, uh, because if I can't find that happiness in my current uh, uh, employer, the market uh, allows me to participate any place. I, I think one of the positive things around COVID is uh, remote work. Uh, we've seen now organizations change their hiring policy to be able to bring talent from all across the planet, uh, which I think is going to open up a lot of opportunities for Again, folks that are curious, they have the passion, perhaps they were located not in the right place or they didn't have the contacts uh, in terms of getting into that uh, uh, world. And, and confidence is really the thing that if you have curiosity and confidence, uh, future is very bright. Uh, if you lack either one of those, then you have to work on it. And, and I mentor quite a bit uh, of folks that are both in, uh, in, in the IT realm and outside of the IT realm. And uh, rather than loading them up with a bunch of business books and, you know, uh, you know somewhat boring kind of theoretical uh, pieces, I, I encourage them to join a project, you know. Uh, start small, uh, develop the foundational elements and the confidence so that you can, uh, you know, create something or be a part of the team that creates something uh, and then build on that. And, and 
you know, so I'm I'm a huge optimist in terms of the opportunity that's out there and and the ability for these individuals to really further their career. I couldn't agree more. And forgive me, but you've opened the door. I'm going to have to go down now, which is which is another another C actually. So you mentioned curiosity, and I could not agree more around that. Um, but I also wanted and confidence, and also to mention compassion and community. And one yeah. of the things I absolutely love seeing you do is the fact that you're partnering with a lot of opportunities to for your employees to invest in like impact projects, and they really really care about. And yeah. So one of them was with Compassion International, I think, and using AI and machine learning to release kids from poverty and, you know, addressing things like trafficking, for example. I've seen so much commitment to projects like that, and I absolutely love it when I see organisations you know, democratising access to the technology to be able to use it and apply it for social impact. So for me, that kind of third C is compassion stroke community. I really love that commitment there and obviously other organisations as well. But it feels like that's resonating more and more You know, everything around tech for good and really scaling and applying projects in that area. So I'd also you know, encourage people listening to look for opportunities to learn through those types of projects as well, because they're really, really you know, very meaningful work to do. Like mentoring, as you were talking about there, I think it's a really joyful, rewarding thing. Yeah, absolutely. This this is core to Splunk's uh, belief system. is is really uh, about having a uh, cause and being part of the solution. Uh, technology is such a powerful enabler. Uh, it enables uh, very difficult humanity's most difficult problems. Uh, you know, can be solved through technology. But again, if you don't have the compassion, you don't have the community, you don't have the diversity of thought and ideas and uh, inclusiveness that you need to bring together a village. Uh, you know, quite frankly, going at it alone does not solve any of the big problems that we have on the planet. And uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that the pandemic uh, becomes, uh, because it's such a global experience, uh, probably the first one that in uh, certainly our lifetimes, or, or you can argue actually in the history of humanity, uh, we are connected. We see uh, every part of the globe go through similar challenges. And I think hopefully that creates a good will towards how do we address some of these problems in a collaborative way, in a compassionate way, use technology for good, uh, not just for profit, uh, and, and be able to kind of make, uh, make the village much bigger and much stronger. Absolutely agree. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, obviously, we've had this pandemic contagion. For me, this is a chance to, you know, looking on that positive side, I couldn't agree with you more. What can we learn from this? Um, you yeah. know, how can we reimagine and reframe the, the future from this shared experience and really apply that learning for good? So I couldn't agree more on that collaboration, um, I think, is key. You know, we've had projects like the NBC consortium that so many organisations involved in and you know bringing different areas of society together to address these challenges in the SDGs so I'm, I'm really impressed like I say for your support in that area I think it's fantastic so contagion of positive change let's let's aim for that from as we move out of the, the pandemic experience and kind of thinking about innovation more broadly what are you seeing there um, as we're moving in this transition phase now what, what types of innovation do you expect to see um, going forward? So I think there's a lot of innovation in how teams uh, collaborate. And I, I think some of this, again, is to remove the mundane uh, and, and the highly repetitive pieces. But I think back to inclusivity, um, there's a huge opportunity for us to almost have a mentoring and training program within IT. So I'll, I'll give you a few concrete examples of uh, you know, how some of our clients have done this. Um, so instead of having a typical war room where 100 people jump on a conference call uh, and, and everybody is trying to figure out where the problem is uh, when there's an outage or when there's a, a you know, P1, uh, bringing in some of the more junior members to the team at the table so that they can see firefighting uh, you know, live. And, and then leveraging the tools and technologies as a way of identifying uh, post-incident reviews so that you understand why did this happen? What was the blind side? It's almost like basically having the doctors create the vaccines on the spot, being, being able to not only firefight, but be able to understand how to prevent it the next time. And I think the only way this gets done is through collaborative tools. So for, for example, with some of our solutions, we archive 
uh, the minute by minute activity when the troubleshooting was taking place. Then we can run AINML so that the next time a similar incident comes up, the first thing we say is, hey, we've seen this before. This is uh, this was the log of who uh, addressed this problem. And, and uh, you know, and do you want us to automate it? So it gives an opportunity for perhaps uh, the, the newer members of the team, uh, I don't want to call them non-experts, but people who don't have as much uh, experience, participate and then eventually take over and this creates capacity for teams because then the teams don't have to, well, and, and quite frankly, it creates a quality of life because if you're a developer and you got an application that's being updated on a frequent basis, the last thing you want is to be paged regularly. You, you want peace and quiet and be able to have confidence that some of the uh, newer team members could take that over. So this concept of SRE, site reliable engineering, uh, is a concept that came out of Google. It's taken a lot of momentum. It's a it's impacting organizational structure, and there's a lot of innovation that's coming with it uh, to basically have an outside in view of how customers look at services, and then how do you collaborate across application teams, infrastructure teams to help diagnose problems and become more and more proactive and predictive. That's fantastic. A great example there. I think you're really describing like the evolution really of operation centers, you know, focusing on that communication, transparency, that transitional learning, that hands-on kind of learning by doing that you were talking about there, and focus on observability and aspects like that as well is exactly where we're going to really drive productivity, but also um that satisfaction and freeing up of time as we were talking about before as well, which is fantastic. And I'm personally also excited about some of the immersive collaboration tools that are developing. Yeah. Just thinking about, um, go, go, going back to my telecoms background a bit as well, but I'm really interested in what we're seeing with the 5G applications going more and more mainstream over the next kind of 18 months or so. Um, and that is really gonna be able to bring to life the, the art of the possible with immersive technologies. You know, things that have been around for quite some time in terms of VR and AR, this is actually going to enable the true actualization of that. And I think that's going to be another next level in terms of immersive training, but also in areas such as empathy and support for mental health and other aspects of organizational life as well. So I'm really excited about the enablement that will bring as well. Absolutely. And I, I couldn't, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of AR in particular and it's uh, everyday applications. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of organizations use it. Uh, again, to bring knowledge uh, at the fingertips of the practitioners, uh, for example, being able to very quickly identify uh, where the uh, issues may be on a on a hardware chassis, or if you're if you're out there servicing towers, uh, cell phone towers, etc., being able to understand exactly what you're looking at, correlating the log and the data information with with the physical, uh, you know, camera. Uh, we've seen in factories people leverage it for IoT use cases uh, so that they can understand, uh, you know, the status and the health of, of the different machines. A uh, lot of innovation, and I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think 5G is a huge enabler in terms of changing uh, what is possible, again, out, out on the edge and uh, closer to where the customers are. And, and with it, by the way, it will, it will bring more challenges around security and around operations and that's why uh you know never a dull moment in technology lots absolutely. of things absolutely i think iot devices are set to double i think aren't they by 2025 and yeah. you're absolutely right again it will come back to training and culture and security is as a shared responsibility um and obviously things around trust and investments in those areas as well but again it comes back to all these elements coming together it's that holistic holistic but integrated point isn't it i think and um maybe looking beyond that so to kind of round our, our conversation here if we were going to look at recommendations so we've talked really about different areas of, of resilience in many ways around around the it workforce so what would your kind of core recommendations be for organizations looking ahead about how to optimize this how to do this right I think the first uh, recommendation would be um, uh, unleash the power of data. So rather than uh, looking at uh, an org structure or a set of tools, look at the data as your best asset 
and, uh, and, and be mindful and intentional around your data strategy. Second uh, recommendation is to build a collaborative playbook so that you can, uh, you know, again, break down the silos. So the new uh, processes should not be static. It shouldn't be tickets that are flying back and forth, almost tagging each other. Uh, we look at it as a much more collaborative incident response where you have different team members uh, based on their expertise, based on their knowledge, be able to contribute both positively on a new release or a new feature that goes out, but also in a reactive fashion to help troubleshoot where the problems are. I think that that gives us a completely different view around IT. It helps also build skill sets within the organization so that you can have a deeper bench and, and create that resiliency that you're looking for. Uh, second is this notion that I brought up earlier around post-incident reviews or PIRs. Again, this is a fundamental concept that came out of the SRE concept, the site reliability engineering. It's the idea to go back and review after something bad happens. Why did it happen? Not, not to place blame on anyone but really around continuous learning and continuous improvement. Organizations that spend more of their time on PIRs ensure that they have less outages in the future. So if you wanna move from being reactive to proactive and predictive, I would almost look at it as how many PIRs do you have? How do you take action on those PIRs? How do you fix your blind spots? How do you move faster? And the last but not least, Let's not forget this is a team sport. It's not about the network team or the server team or the application team. It's about all of the team. So, um, you know, you have to have fun. We, we've seen organizations actually look at this as a way of bringing everybody together on, a, on having a consistent mission and vision. The more customer centric that is, the more this is about not, you know, how, how did the folks experience it, the better you're gonna be and that, uh, you know, part of that, and I think you hinted on this, is the cross-pollination, uh, the ability to have people move between teams really also kind of builds that robust team-first uh, mindset. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I've even seen some organizations bringing in um, some employees who were basically the cusp of leaving the organization due to retirement, who were effectively doing like a reverse mentoring and and really passing on that knowledge and keeping me involved over the next five years. There's so many great rewarding um, experiences I'm seeing happening there. So yeah, I couldn't agree more. Cross-pollination of ideas, co-creation of solutions, bringing different areas of the organization together. I've seen some really nice agile methodologies about how to do that around certain problems and projects. So yeah, I couldn't agree more strongly. I think yeah. one final thing I might mention, yeah. if that's okay, because you mentioned that analogy of team sport. <laughs> Uh, I think I'll end on this point as well about team sport also being a cultural and community one again. And I wanted to mention this is something I've seen in the UK firsthand because I've done some work with Young Minds UK um, and Splunk have really supported that. And, and your organisation did this 24 hour hackathon. I think you called it a Swiftathon or something like that, yes. um, if memory serves me right. But that was amazing as well. So, again, for me, that team sport, it's not just about the alignment of different departments across the, across the organization. It's not just about co-creating challenges and solutions and bringing all these elements together. It's also about your community and your values um, and emphasizing that and really doing that together as well. So I've been super impressed by that. So I think it's kind of a team sport and that community sport as well, so to speak. So yeah, I'm really, really impressed by that. Yeah, and, and as I mentioned, communities are only as strong as the individuals, the individuals that have curiosity, have compassion, have diversity, uh, bring quite frankly, different set of ideas. And, and this is one of the things that's great about, uh, you know, uh, looking at the technology landscape because uh, it, 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 all of our lives are being changed with these ideas that came from different places. and. You know, again, as a team, people executed on them. No one person created the, uh, the smartphone. No one person created any of the technologies that we rely on. It was a group, a team. And quite frankly, in many cases, they pivoted from other ideas and through the diversity and, uh, you know, uh, di different experiences, they finally landed on what uh, really has changed our, uh, our, our planet. And I hope we continue to progress on that change. 
So true, yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I think one final point from me, I think we've really spoken here about when we're looking at resiliency um, in our teams in this kind of remote environment, but increasingly hybrid environment, um, ambidexterity to change from an organizational to an individual point of view is absolutely key. And that diversity of experience we've talked about throughout, that ability to pivot, that confidence in skills, the ability to invest in skills and culture alongside the technology and the three C's, I think we should call that really, about curiosity, a collaboration and community, I think has really come to the fore. So honestly, such a pleasure to speak to you. Um, and I hope everyone really enjoys the conversation. Thank you, Kia, a real joy, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.